and viewed as favorable. Mm. Okay. I repeat it. So transgression occurs when the false philosophies are indulged in, when they are sanctioned and viewed as favorable. Right? So it is important that this is understood as there are some who give up as soon as a temptation is presented to the mind, asserting that they have already sinned. This creates a, a spirit of self-defeat and does not allow for the overcoming of the temptation, right? But establishes fear in the heart for that temptation and thus they make us more susceptible to the temptation, right? And I was, some time back I was looking at Brother Medina's study on temptation disciples. And he made that point, and it, it kind of resounded with me, right? It resonated with me because really and truly, sometimes you face temptation, but yeah, because you develop a certain fear for it because there's something you faced before, and it topple you, right? You develop a certain fear. So when it comes, your, your, your mind gone black, and you're not dealing adequately with the temptation, right? All right. Okay. All right. So, for instance, you might be, you might have faced a temptation in the past that was easily besetting you, right? So now, you're, let's say you come to the truth now, right? But there's a something that was besetting you before. So the temptation comes, but you already build up a certain fear for it because it was something that used to topple you before. So you, when it comes now, because of that fear you have for it, it actually makes you more susceptible to fall. It is important that this is understood that temptation is not seen. As there, is some, as there are some who give up as soon as a temptation is presented to the mind, asserting that they have already sinned. This creates a spirit of self-defeat and, do, and does not allow for the overcoming of the temptation, but establishes fear in the heart for that temptation and thus they make us more susceptible to that temptation. Right? Right. But for instance, if you know that something was disappearing, right? Let's see. I know you say you had a thing for, for alcohol, right? No. When you so our temptation for alcohol is presented to you, right? But you never really adequately deal with it. But because it was a thing, a, 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 um, issue for you before, you had that fear now, and that fear crippling you, so that you don't actually reason out what's the implications of this, what is really saying about, what is really saying about creation, how does this attack the divine nature, you never really adequately work that out, so in your mind you had this crippling fear, and that now, because you had that crippling fear, you're not using faith, you're more susceptible to fall, so, you're, so that's basically it. Right? So what is the reason why the saints of Yahweh are allowed to face temptation? Right? So why 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 are we allowed by God to face temptation? Temptations come to try us and to prove our sincerity 
Amen. and our understanding of the science of salvation. Amen. Right? So I read it over. Temptations come to try us to prove our sincerity and our understanding of the science of salvation. Amen. Amen. Right? Thus, temptations provide the opportunity for the faith knowledge which we have received to be worked out and applied in our experience against the temptation. Amen. 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 Right? Amen. So I was Let's not be that camera now. I think you should quote it back over now because plenty of people may not hear any back because of the set of talking in the back place. So put it over for all of us benefit, please. Right, no, 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 no. So the, the question was basically, why are we allowed? Why are the saints of God allowed to face temptation? Right? It says temptations come to try us and to prove our sincerity and our understanding of the science of salvation. Thus, temptations provide the opportunity for the faith knowledge which we, have, which we have received to be worked out and applied in our experience against the temptation. Amen. Right? So we look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. So then we will say that temptation is a good thing in that day. Well, so in that light, when you look at it in that, in that light, right? The, what it is meant to achieve, that's why you see scripture say, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Why? Yeah, I think now it's later on. Right, because the trying of your faith work in patience, right? But we turn to First Peter chapter 1. Amen, amen. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. So, it says here, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And glory and glory. Right? So, right, praise and honor and glory, right? At the appearing of Jesus Christ. So, basically, that, when it comes to us, that, up, that is the opportunity now for us to really reason out. Because we might receive light. Now, when it comes, it's for us to really, to, prove that in our experience, you know? So, when it says, so we, so on that point, seeing that we, um, it comes to, to achieve this purpose, I'm gonna say this point, we are not allowed to be tempted above what we can bear, Amen. but God will wait the temptation, provide a means of escape. This is a hinge point on another. So we'll go to the text, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. First Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. Right, so I'll quote the text, right? It says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above what he, that ye he are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a will to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Right? So, with the temptation, there comes a means of escape that you're able to bear it, or to handle it appropriately. Right? So, thus, Thus, a man in Christ is not tempted without God revealing some truth to his mind 
that if applied would keep him from sin. Right? So I quote that over. Thus, a man in Christ is not tempted without God first revealing some truth to his mind that if that truth is applied, would keep him from sin. Right? So, brethren, I say this to her because and it, it's so important that when it says, let every man be swift to listen and slow to speak. Because sometimes you might be there, you're fellowship with brethren, and they might just say certain things, you know, you're sharing truth. And something passes in the discussion. And it comes here, and you don't even know that that truth that get that put out there is really what to help you in a coming trial. You know, sometimes you just go, amen, amen, and we rejoice, and then we go on with it. And we really take the time to meditate upon what was being said. And I have personally found in my experience that when you really listen to what brethren is saying, you know, they're abiding and they're sharing truth. And you listen and you reason out the implications, you work it out. And then sometimes you face a situation, maybe two hours later, maybe two days later, and the very same truth that the brethren was discussing, and somebody might have just said in passing in the discussion, was actually exactly what you needed for that situation. Right? So, I go on. Each time we are tempted, it is to prove us whether we have learned the principles of faith which was delivered to us. When we overcome temptation, we become more settled, rooted in the truth, never to be removed. No more children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine by the cunning craftiness of men. Right? So I quote two texts, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 to 19. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. <laughs> Right. So, now unto him. <coughs> Alright, so now unto him who is able to keep us from, who is able to do abundantly, exceedingly abundantly, sorry, above all that we, sorry. If you could just give us a few seconds, I can have two billions in the market. So now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, verse 20, abundantly above all that we can ask or take according to the power that worketh in us. And we know, you know, the gospel, the power of God unto salvation, right? So unto him, so I think that, so, so unto the power that work in us. The next text with that is 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 to 10. She wants, she wants, she wants, she First Peter, chapter 5, verses 8 to 10. It says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, 
walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the womb. But the God of all grace, who had called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, to make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Amen. So really and truly, is to establish us in the faith, to settle us, right? So, and every temptation resisted is one step closer to achieve victory. Amen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Sister Vanessa, yes, your text. <laughs> I just want to quote the text, right? Because you were quoting in Corinthians to show that you know one would give us anything that is not common to us and also would make a way to escape the temptation and you know to show that God gave us the truth before the temptations come, right? So I just have a text in first Peter, second Peter chapter two one verse nine. First part of the text. <laughs> <laughs> Second Peter chapter two verse nine. It says here this part: The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. And the other part says, and preserve the unjust and the day of judgment. We punish, right? Are we looking at the first part? The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. So we see here. If he knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation, what is the problem there? It's really with us. Because as you said, he gives us the truth or the faith to deal with it by the grace of God. So when it is in not, or you end up kneeling, or you end up falling, it is really you who choose to hold on to the temptation or you did. And God knows how to deliver the just of the temptation with the faith. Amen. 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 Right? So. I record the point. So every temptation resisted is one step closer to, a, to achieve victory. Question. A statement. In the scripture in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, it says, Be sober, be vigilant. You understand? He said, Because your adversary is as well, a devil. Walking around the game, two million people. Yeah, yeah, the devil is a growing lion. Walking about the game, two million people. So look at this scripture call us to be sound minded and to be vigilant. It means, it means, in the vigilance is used in a way to so watching in a particular way. You're watching in a particular way, keeping to keep yourself. Because you know the adversaries you're facing, you know how he is. You understand? And that the show when it comes, what you must be found doing resisting him in steadfast in the faith. So a Christian is one always have a watchful eye to their born again self. They're always watching the born again self. And 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 the Bible show when you're watching him, when you're watching and you form resisting by faith, you say then the God of all peace, the God of all peace, when you're watching, fulfilling these conditions, he will establish you. He will strengthen you. He will settle you. You understand? It, it, it's, not, it, it, it's, it's not like this is like, I God said, thou oh, shall not. And you hold it in your mind in a trivial manner. But you hold it in your mind in such a way, you, 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 it causes you to safeguard into yourself then. You understand? And that is why it's being spoken. Right? Before I go on, go on. James chapter 1 and verse 12. <laughs> <laughs> James chapter 1 and verse 12. It says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, 
which Yahweh have promised to hit to them that love him. So, brethren, we are to endure. We are to abide through. When, when these studies are given, care, really and truly, is not just something to, oh yes, we are the truth, we are the truth. As Brother Hakia was saying, right, and that was on my mind, it's something really and truly, we ought to really work out and apply personally to our own experience, to deal with our own self. Because you can't really go out there, as you were saying, to try to help anybody if the faith isn't really working in you to help you. Right? So, I'll go on, right? So when dealing with temptation, we should not be content with knowing that the general premise of a temptation is false and that the ideals are contemptible. But we must identify what specifically is wrong with it. What We must identify the specific points of error. The soul of the spirit may then be applied to destroy those fallacies individually. Our warfare against temptation must be with tact and skill and the strike of the sword precise. I'm saying this because, you know, sometimes you might, okay, you might be facing a temptation and you might, you might have in your mind, well, okay, I don't understand temptation is false. And we know, let's say you might be facing something with lust, right? And you just go, God is eternal. God is eternal. God is eternal. But did you really identify what particularly about the temptation? What is it saying? What are the points of error it is presenting? What is it really saying and presenting to your mind? What points are you bringing to attack the divine nature itself? And then when you reason that out, now that you have that in your mind, you could really and truly systematically and precisely surgically deal with each point according to the understanding of the faith that you have in your mind. Amen. Right? So when you're dealing with it, it's not on a dogma or just some, you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, but it's really, go ahead. Could you give us like a, a practical illustration of Okay. Let me say for instance, I'll give you it because I use this a lot. Lust, right? Because it's something everybody could down there. God had given me a study sometime back with regards to marriage and the rights exercised in it and what it means in the plan of salvation. Now I understand that in the social compact between a man and a woman, it is to symbolize Christ and his church. And that which is exercised in it is supposed to teach the intimacy and in what is taken in the enticement and plan of salvation. It was supposed to impress that upon the mind. Now for me now, to accept a temptation of lust, is for me to say, is for me really and truly, is to blaspheme or is for me to pervert the gospel of Christ. Because I'm looking at this very same thing by which I am called and by which I am saved by. I'm really and truly taking this and perverting it before, before the world. That is what I'm doing in my mind. Amen. Whenever I accept that. Amen. So that is the faith that you learn. Practically, you reason it out. You see the individual points of error as it's attacking the faith of Christ. Amen. And you're systematically dealing with each point. Amen. Right? Amen. So that's just one example I could give. Right? Yes. I have an example, right? Me and my husband was discussing this a long time ago. So I'll An example, right? Somebody yeah. asked for an example. Yeah. And this is what me and my husband had discussed a while now, right? And I had shot a real nice shoot on my mind. So for example, the same example as lust, right? As pertaining to women. Now we have a false idea in society that a woman with a small hip, a small waistline and a big hip and big, you know, Maximus. <laughs> that, is the, that is the ideal, right? And it is true. That is, that is well, I don't mean the ideal is true, I mean the fact that society, right, right. So society's idea 
of an ideal woman is a small lace and big hip and big behind. Right? And if a woman not shaped like that, that is not the ideal woman. That is what society does push, right? And sometimes I was studying the Bible and it strikes my mind. The goddess Ashtoreth, mm -hmm. the, um, the lady of the grove, mm -hmm. the ancient Israel used to worship. Is a, is the lady of the group had small waist, big hips, big um, breasts, and big behind. And look, that's the ideal that that's the idea that society pushes as the ideal woman. So what they're really pushing is really a false god. So when you so when you look at when when men you go down the road and you see a good small hip, big small waist, big hip, that's the ideal. You have to bring in a mind. That is a goddess. You saying that mm -hmm. question? You saying that lady is a god because she's shaped like that. Mm -hmm. That is the ideal. Mm -hmm. That is the goddess Ashtoreth. Right. Who, who said that is the ideal? Mm -hmm. You understand? Why you have to have a small waist and make her to be the ideal woman? You understand? That's what society so does push, and that's how the lady of the group is shape and the pushing her towards God. And ancient Israel was pushing her as the as God's wife. <laughs> so what? So you actually attacking God by pushing that? When you lost after that, you pushing that as the ideal, you pushing that as a God. So, so I see. I have one question to ask you. Since you bring that, if a man happen to happen to be walking and you see this 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 girl just have this tight pants and this tight tight clothes, and everything printing out, you say, woo! Uh, she call, she she is a visa. Yeah, you watching? She taking a he taking a sneak peek. And she up on the cross, and when she crossing, she didn't look up on her half on the chair on her part of the sheep. How do you want to do the woman now? That is the point! So she's not going to want to see what is fucking. That's what I say. I say, if the same flesh you're lost in after, get bombs on or something, you'll see what you was really lost in after, just a piece of flesh. <laughs> so I'm just going to go on to a couple of pitfalls to avoid when dealing with temptation. Actually, so pitfalls when dealing with temptation, right? And this is basically some, but basically what I was touching before. Receiving certain truths. And Sister Denise has shared a nice truth to me on the debt of Christ and so forth, and how it would influence your interaction with people, right? <laughs> now we receive truth, and we might just say, but yeah, boy, you see, Yahweh is God, we're going for them watchtowers, boy. Jesus is God, we're going for them watchtowers. Or, um, something and we're ready to go out and, and debate. <laughs> Sinfulness. <laughs> right? And my church ain't teaching that thing, so I'm going for them. But certain things about it, certain theological truths that were presented, right? We, we hold it just, just as theology. But it not, we're not really reasoning it out to apply, exactly, to have it as a personal experience to work in us personally, right? And so that, that's basically where, this is the first pitfall I touched on before. You can look at Romans chapter two, verse 17 to 23. Brother Michael, wanna read this first? Romans chapter two, right? Romans chapter 2, verses 17 to 23. Okay. Romans chapter 2, from verses 17 to 23, right? Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in, in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and provest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, 
and are confident that thou, that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, in light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, he which has the form of the knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou, therefore, which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhors idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Until verse 23, right? <coughs> thou that maketh thy boast of the law, to break in the law, dishonorest thou God? So look, we had certain theological understandings of the law and so forth, but what was being the truth within it that's supposed to sanctify us? We're not really working it in us for, in our learning to work in us for righteousness. So we, we might just, and every truth basically that we receive is to deal with sin, really and truly, that is it. Brother Medina said to ask if it if 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 it if it's possible for us to forget how to lose. But I think about the question and the Bible says us after good gifts and stuff like that. So in that lost in forgetting how to lose where from the flesh that is. Yeah, of course. If it's possible to forget how to lose. Well when it when when it is that this coming to your mind, for instance. Do you remember what hope tastes like? Who? Do you remember what hope tastes like? Oh, no. <laughs> no. I, I used to eat it. I can't even remember what it tastes like. They really and truly, you put them, play them in front of me, and like, I watch every discuss. So look at it. It's something, certain things, they may not have been such deep rooted values in your mind from before. Now you come to the truth, you learn how to deal with it, and you, you pass on. Now, those things don't even become a, a anything to you. You're passed by normal, normal, normal. And it's not a value in your mind at all. You won't even think about it a second time. Because you already settled and rooted in your mind about that. The faith is established in your mind about that. So when it comes to any temptation, or anything that will pose a temptation to you, once the faith really and truly is rooted in your soul, it will come a point where the knowledge will be presented to you, but it is nothing. It really is nothing. Right? So, that's just my answer. So, Mr. Computer, chapter 1, verse we live in a world where, right? I want to bring this point. You have the memory bank. They just store your information in, right? So a person remembering a particular wrong is not a sin. A person remembering how to do so lost after a particular thing is not a sin. So you can remember how whatsoever used to take place. You have it our knowledge of it in the memory bank. But to practice it, you have the faith against that. So once you might have the remembrance of the wrong, or the remembrance of what you used to, how you used to practice the wrong, you will not partake in it because your faith develop against that. So you will have that remembrance of it. You understand? The time when, when that will be forgotten, right? As, as the story shows, it's a particular time where the person and them start to think and ask yourself, try to think to remember how to do so, and they can't remember how to do certain things because they see them. Right? But now in the world, having a remembrance of our wrong is not so. If you remember how you used to drink that, remember how you used to lust after that, because you lost in for a particular pattern of thinking or knowledge. So you remember that. However, you have faith against it, so you will not after it. You understand? Particular knowledge chopped there against it. But the time will come where you will remember the taste of it. 
or you might remember the taste of it in your mouth, but you have the knowledge that, hey, are you see poor? But you can't remember how it tastes because you lose all the memories of the taste of it. Like smoking cigarettes, I can't remember how that tastes. I can't remember how cigarette tastes, but I remember I used to smoke. I used to smoke meat also. I remember I used to drink too, but I can't remember how it tastes. So you lose those appetite for them things because of the faith knowledge, you lose appetite for it. So you can't remember it. However, the knowledge of the wrong is there. So when I, it was really, okay, we understand that you have certain memories, right? But when you look at it, for instance, yes, well, you remember like you used to eat both. But that, that memory, right, really and truly, it shouldn't really bring up a sort of, Huh? Right, basically. So, so that knowledge, so even though you might come and a knowledge is presented to you, somebody could come and say, well, I go down by the bar and I remember what you said, and all that memory come back to you. But that's so disdainful for you now because you already deal with that, with the fate in your mind. That is like, what you come with that for? Seriously? And you're going your way. So that's, that's the light in which I'm looking at it at. Right? Because... Right, so that's the light in which I'm looking at it at. Because you can't force a particular memory of an event out of your mind. You can't force that. You can't really do that. Right? Just try to get uh, some damaging consequences. Right? Even though, even though it comes back in your memory, uh, right? You have no value for it anymore. Right. Because you also have memory versus to help you to already overcome that to deal with. So you have an example of temptation in the marriage situation. So I'm asking you now in Chinese realm. When two people got married in Queen Janet, hmm? a whole year was allotted to the both parties, but more so to the man, to be absorbed. He was absorbed from like going in the army and so on and so on. And he would have a whole year to be with the family. Yeah. What would you think about somebody who got married, whether the male or the female, and within the early period of the marriage, you find it, you find that culture that is happening in China, right? In and when I say culture, I'm talking about the good in common. That doesn't mean it was not a little job or anything. Else. But at least you would expect somebody, they know got married and so on. You know, you know what I mean? The portrait, well, the portrait might be the wrong way, but if buying in together because we don't get married and so on, will be more intense. What would you say? Would you say, to, would you say either of the parties will you then go on that road of temptation to break that type of culture? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I am my wife now get married and so on. Not get married. And within two, three months, I show more interest in, 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 in this sister here. <laughs> what would you say in something like that? You say that is setting up myself to be tempted on the temptation. Because we do have those situations. I don't think we have it in the church, but I know we have it. So, let me show you the sign, right? So, with somebody married in two, three months, and after two, three months, you're showing interest in another person. I am not sure I fully grasp the situation, brother. Like, no, but the situation I like to would you agree that either of you goes to one or the other is setting up themselves to be unduly tempted? Yes. Oh. Yeah. So, that's so, 
I think, from what I understand, right, brother is saying that you're like somebody that now get married three months or whatever, and after that point, they're showing interest or a lot of interest in another person, right? It, when you just when you say interest, right? Yeah, like, yeah, you had, you had more elaborate on that because interest could mean a lot of things. They could, like the brother, they could be, okay, somebody now come to the place already, you study with them, help them to develop, right? Or is, huh? I guess it's actually a problem now. Yeah, but showing interest, it is a blind channel. Right, so you showing emotional interest to in somebody else? That's what you say? Just to go this particular situation, when you do not get married, you will expect a kind of bonding. Because when marriage is not made quick. But that's how it was in ancient Israel. Because you will have a whole year, you will be absorbed from going to fight war and stay and come for the wife. So a trend like that will continue up to now. I mean, you expect people to not get married and so on. We're talking about temptation here, right? So I'm simply asking if a situation like that develops, would you agree that that is setting up themselves? Okay. 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 Social circumstances are more serious sometimes, right? The social interaction. Sometimes some of us put ourselves in situation to give ourselves temptation on people. And that is because of insincerity behind the law. And because of the want to practice what we say, you will get both kind of interactions. Right. I agree, I agree. But right? yes. So I'm just saying that as a woman. Yeah. I agree. That's true. In other words, if temptation has to come for us, let us not initiate. Amen. Don't initiate it for it to come, and when it comes, we're going to cry and all kind of things coming. As the scripture says, make no occasion for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. She said that the same broad thing. Now, sometimes when you speak speaking the truth, you have to put the gun up in the air and pull the trigger. But if you aim it... That's somebody here. Heavy conviction. I hear you. I hear you. So, the next point. Okay. What would cause somebody to now marry somebody? And within three months' time, you're looking for a certain kind of relation with somebody else. You understand? That's why you see, as the sister was saying, when you're talking marriage, marriage is not something you just jump into just like that. You just meet a person and think, all right, I want to marry you, person and so on. These are things that must take time. You need to make sure that your partner really love all, two are all on the same, on the same trend. Of course, it may have variation in development and so on, but that's not what I'm talking about. So I'm saying, like Sister White said, she says, if when you're, if when, if, when, that's not true, if when a person is contemplating marriage and they separate two times a day, you need to start praying four times a day. That's to show you how serious that is. So I can't see somebody married to somebody and remember what you're marrying. If you're marrying, remember there are different reasons why people get married. But in this field, as far as we know, to get married for the right reasons. Right, where each person seeks to develop one another to the glory of God. Right? So if a person marries another person for the shape and the form and so on, then what can happen after that? 
So you can watch a person association with a person, you watching on and watching the association and considering in your mind something more than the other. That is transgression. That is why you did that. In two years we had a judge and in two years we have to be killed. That is your experience. <laughs> Why, why some of these contributions is expressions of truth, but I think it, it is not directly addressing what was asked initially. I put it in the context of here you have a situation in ancient Israel. A man and a woman get married in Israel. Provision was made by God that when this man and this woman is not married, the man is exempted from certain military activities and fighting and so on, so that he could stay and comfort his wife. So one in Israel will expect this man and this woman, good, somebody say what that Bible, no, 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 no. We will listen carefully, we will, we will get the question, right? So what I'm saying is we are talking about temptation. And, and my ultimate question is, in our social interactions, but since you have given the example of marriage, and you show, because they said they like to give that example, and you show that the marriage is supposed to be showing Christ's relationship to the church. I was asking the question that, According to ancient Israel, a man and a woman have got married. A whole year the man is exempted from military service so that he could be with his wife. So the Israelites and them who know that marriage took place will expect to see this man and this woman as newlyweds. Right? They will expect to see them. And when I say expect to see them, I mean they will expect a certain type of bonding and so closeness together. It's always together, but they're not married. So I'm simply absent. If here you have a couple now get married, and the time a month, two months, three months, one or the other, either the man or the woman, is more having a bonding relationship with other people. Right? I am saying, isn't not that an avenue whereby persons could be setting up situation for their own temptation? Yes. 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 What I'm saying, in that situation, they better read, the person already fall because the idea that come to them to leave their partner, to go on association, with, to seek association with somebody else, that idea that come to them is a temptation and they accept that going after seeking the association of this other individual. So the person already fall. But it can go further. It can go further. Association and affiliation as in the context of one. So here, let me go into one more time. Let me get so, so, so put everything into the context. The brother here gave an example as to temptation, and he said he liked to give the example like with a marriage. Because when two people marry, they're supposed to exemplify the knowledge of Christ related to the church. But I give that as an example. So I was asking the question. According to the culture of the ancient Israelites, when a man and a woman got married in ancient Israel, a whole year was given to the man, exempting him from military duties and so on, so that he could bond with his newly wed wife. So the, uh, the, the, in Israel, the people in Israel here will expect a certain kind of relationship between two people because they will know it will be normal. Mm -hmm. what, what's what I'm asking? 
So the person now got married, the couple now got married. I mean, they have one, two months, three months. You ain't seen the bonding that's supposed to be taking place between the couple. But one or the other is more in association with other parties, whatever the party is. I am was simply asking, is that situation one in which one of the other person is setting up themselves to be No, but the party said they already call I agree. I agree with you. So or you can answer the question, what divine purpose has God given to serve that? What divine purpose? <laughs> no, I mean to say the What you have already said here, right? If God has given a year for the person to bond together, and within that year, the person is associating with somebody and more, they are much more closer to and more bonding with somebody else. Now, they may not do anything. If you know what I mean. The question is, what is the divine purpose in that? In other words, what could you identify as a divine purpose in that? The things you can't find it. The only thing you are left is to openly speculate. You understand? So that's the reason why one should be careful. One should be careful. Proceed with caution, my brethren. So the next thing is dealing superficially with the temptation. Right? So sometimes you might you might face a temptation and you might quick 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 get reason something and you got right but you ain't really go into it and strip it apart and see the, the the horribleness of it so you could deal with it properly, right? So it's just you're not really forcefully pursuing it to destroy destroy that value. Right. I thought strike. In other words, when, when you superficially deal with it, you learn to hate it. Because when you adequately deal with it, true faith, you just learn to hate it. Yeah. So God, I call me saying when you when you superficially deal with it. <laughs> He said, when you superficially deal with it, you do you ain't really learn to hate it. You ain't really learn to hate it, yeah. right? But when you deal with it, when you deal with it properly, you, you just get this hatred for the for the wrong. Amen. Right? Through the faith. Right? There's always a process of learning to hate what you have done before, but during that period of time, what do you do? That is lingering. So you superficial with me. You don't even know how to <laughs> no, I'm sorry, sorry. What I said is this, sorry. During the process of learning to hate what you formerly love, what do what happens during the time? How would you deal with it? Because remember, you learn to hate these things. Take for instance, as I just tried to say to a, a, a brother, can a person forget to lust? <laughs> Think about that. Yeah. Alright, so during the period of time when you are um, learning to hate the thing, what do you do? Right? Is there a superficial um, dealing with the temptation? No, because you can have lingering victory. Learn to abide. So probably superficial for the person who hasn't learned to hate the thing yet could be not even knowing how to abide. Ask some people if they learn how to abide, and you will see their minds are always on something else. And they have to learn to discipline the mind to abide. But I'm going to be superficial. Um, going, going, up, going about it super, superficially is not humanistic, or the faith you'll be using, superficial. But a true Christian who is um, handling temptation, notice what I said, handling temptation. Without, not within. True person is handling temptation without. 
Okay? They don't superficially deal with temptation. And right here, as the brother said, if it's superficially dealing with it, they have learned to hate it. But learning to hate certain temptations that they were familiar with is a process through faith. Right? And through understanding the various nuances of it. But during that time, they're supposed to abide and be still sinful. So the issue there is not learning to abide or getting problem with abiding, probably because the person has different, at times their mind go on different um, ideals that they have. You see? So whenever they superficially deal with this, some troop as the better showing, they didn't go into the, the real way to it, but they take some and what is it in all and they didn't do it. But it didn't work it out thoroughly, that would be superficial. Yes, yes, that's what you do. And um, the transgression against the truth and destroying it because we rely on a lot of doctrine. Right? So you really just you really go into it and see the power of the seven to get it. Right? So I'm gonna quote a text. And it's um first second Kings chapter 13, verse 14 to 19. And Kings 13, 14 to 19. So 2 Kings 13, 14 to 19. I say goes. Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness where he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O oh my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put forth thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hand. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot! And he shot. And he said, The arrow of Yahweh, the arrow of Yahweh is deliverance. And, and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. <coughs> for that for thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek until thou hast consumed them. And he said, Take the arrows, and he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, Smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. And a man of God was wrought with him and said, thou, thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then hast thou smitten Syria till thou hast consumed it. But whereas thou shalt smite Syria but twice, but thrice. Now the reason why I quote this text, really and truly is to show that in that was showing the pursuit, okay, he was supposed to persevere in it, continue in it, and he would have overcome and destroy his enemy. Right? But he go and he, and he stay in hand. So I liken in that same situation in the act of temptation. When things come now, you deal with it in a superficial sense. And you don't really go into it and pursue it to see the horribleness and so you could destroy it altogether. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so what? Yeah. It's gonna come back again. And you you and if you're gonna continue doing that, you'll never really deal with it. You will never deal with and overcome quote on your enemy. Right? In, in this context, right? A question on that, right? A question on that, right? It's a question for thought, right? A person have, have a particular wrong to the use the practice, right? Then you feel that not by the end wrong. So the wrong comment address them. <laughs> And when it comes to them, that just at this time, having seen the faith of Jesus Christ, that just at this time. Two days after, the same thing come up. That just with the faith of Jesus Christ again. A week, two weeks, three weeks after, it come up. When it come up, but they didn't adjust it adequately as they adjust it twice before, but the fall. Would that make the person was superficial from you twice times to adjust it? 
So when I say superficially, okay, so for instance, I give you an example. When it is, I use the example with um, God is eternal. Now when I say superficial, I mean you're dealing with it from the perspective of yeah, it's something that you just dogmatically go over and over and over. You're not really working out the implications or anything. It's just a dogma in your mind, you're using it over and over and over again. Right? Right. So it's like, okay, you might have, okay, God is eternal. But this thing, that's just this dogma. But you're really going to see why well, was the real horribleness of this thing? How it really and truly, and then you can say, okay, this, will apply this here. This one to say this about what apply this truth here. And you're really dealing with it in that sense to really destroy it all together. Right. 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 We have in Hebrews chapter 12. Right in Hebrews chapter 12. It says here, from verse 2 to 4. Well, well in, in verse 1, they talk about the cloud of witnesses, right? And we know that that is. The whole cloud, the whole assembly of the faithful who conquered by faith. So we have them as witnesses. And then those two says, We came unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. I think some of us need to all stick up in in our own time and, and meditate what that means, what it means to endure the cross and despise the shame. And is set down at the right hand of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Oh, some of us easy to get offended if we hear somebody say something bad against us. I myself of that. When you consider this here, this is how Jesus was. This is how we want. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he be wearied and faith in your mind. And then verse 4 said, You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Now Jesus is the example in this context here. When he was in Gethsemane, we know that when he was praying, while he was praying, he decided to let him sleep in. And he was praying, and the prayer was on our behalf. And while he was praying here, the Bible tells us, the sweat came out like large sweats of blood. Medical science, Today is saying they call they say that medical condition is called hematidosis. When somebody is under extreme psychological stress, that does happen. Which one of us here could say we ever reached to that point? And here we have been we have been told here we we have not yet resisted on the blood striking and getting sin. You see? So it is in line with what you're saying here as to how we deal with the thing. Right? If you had it in five times, six times in a show. The intensity and, and, and strength of mind when he wanted to overcome the Syrian with the three times. Hmm. And that is how some of us said that the Syrian or left friend who's rebellious. Here it is there. Here it is there. <laughs> and the greatest psychology can be world. Psychologists in the world is children. They could work out how to get There's one glimpse at the parent face and the child and work out what is favorable to them and what is not favorable to them. One day. You understand? Know, situations like that. So, really and truly, brother, this thing called sin, there is a sign, there is a way, there is a strength and intensity of mind to deal with it. And if we ain't decide to deal with it, so we will, only, we will only be playing. We have to reach this point where we must deal with it and deal with it fully. Amen. 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 Uh, so one more point, and I just read it. I just want to make something clear, right? What I asked Brother Medina, Michael, ask something. He say something, say something, some, more or less something, what I was saying. If you 
superficially deal with a temptation. If you superficially superficially deal with a temptation, but they use a chook, Michael asks if they use a chook if it wasn't in the faith. Right? So but I'm saying if you use a truth, you will be in the faith. That is no question, right? But I, I, I think I'll be right in saying if you use a truth, then say in the faith. So if you're superficially, as you say, that is superficially dealing with it. I won't say superficially dealing with it, meaning that. I won't say superficially dealing with it as like you're procrastinating, where you have to go deeper because the devil not going to come back and present that same thing to you, you will come different. So you have to go deeper and really search the thing and see why you're falling, what used to make you fall, so you will fall again if, if, if you're still falling. But if you then fall, and they use a simple truth, and not seeing that is superficial, I see you use defeat. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, by what I'm saying, I, I, if I'm wrong, I can be corrected as well. Right, so, if you use that truth, you overcome, right? But you then use the, as you say, the adequate truth to deal with it, to smash it. You just use something and you, you, you run past. But you use that truth. Right. But you then go deep. You then mash the it up. You then go the weighty matters in it. You then go there. Right. You need to do that. Right. But you not doing that. That will be superficial because right. it, and there will be lingering there because you need to go deeper. Right. You need to abide there now and see why. Hey, why I use that little bit of truth? Why I then go deep? You know, like that. So that's why I say relying yeah, totally on a dogma. Right. So, so you so, might come and you might get something. You, and you say, okay, God's eternal. And you might use that overcome once or twice, right? Mm -hmm. But as you're doing that, is that you ain't really going into it. Right, so Trust I mean, me. my, point, my uh, point is after you don't do that, the after, the after you don't use the truth, whatever experience you after, if you continue, that will be something superficial if you're using the words superficial to me. That will be procrastination because the faith will tell you, go deeper. Mm -hmm. That is how I see it. Right. So somebody who now come to the truth, they now come, mm -hmm. right? And they get a particular thing. And let's say we don't understand the God here, right? And that is, so whenever thing come, okay, God is righteousness, God. And they use it and they overcome it, mm -hmm. right? But then what I'm saying is, when it comes just a repetitive thing in your mind and you're not really dealing with the heart. Yeah, but what, what, that, that's my point, that's what I'm saying. Right, so that's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this. You can't, can't use one two. You can't. I uh, know, but I'm saying you can't use one two uh, a million times uh, the same way. Then, so so to speak, mm -hmm. because the devil will come back right. more advanced. Exactly. Yeah. So hence, you have to get something else. Exactly. You understand what I'm saying? Exactly. So, so you can use one two for something. I'm not saying no, they're wrong, but just, I, just one of two. Right, that's one thing. But for instance, the same exact thing. You do the same exact thing. The devil will come at you. You have to get something else stronger to, to deal with him, so to speak. So I am saying, whatever you use, if it's a little bit or a big bit, that is not superficial. Well, a little bit there, that will be superficial. You, you going further and not dealing with it properly, that will be superficial because that will be procrastinating. Unless, unless the say they have. It's just a theory of the truth because they're not abiding in Christ. That's what the Bible says here about the Jews in Romans chapter uh, 2. Right? And from verse 17, the old thou art called a Jew and restless in the law and make his like boast of God and yes. knowest his will and approves of the things of the law, incident, being instructed out of the law and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind a light of them that are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of them. Now here we explain. Which has the form of the knowledge and of the truth. Thou therefore which teaches another, teaches not thyself. So if they have a form of the knowledge and of the truth, that is a theory of the truth. But you can't, you can't, in my mind, you can't deal with a temptation with a form of the knowledge. Right, you you didn't deal with the truth. You didn't deal with the truth. So when the truth loses its vital mm -hmm. revelation of the divine nature aspect, right, or its, it, its God glory aspect, or El Doxan aspect, once the truth loses that, you can't be using that portion of truth all the time. Mm -hmm. No, there's a reason why the truth loses its El Doxan element, or its glorifying of the divine nature element. Mm -hmm. It is based upon what you have done to your mind by your transgression. So I feel a light has to come to help you more. 
All right? But if it isn't so, you can take that thing and use it all in time. Amen. Amen. One little Amen. word can fall in. Amen. 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 Right? Amen. So it's what you do to yourself that can cause that to happen. Once that is the case, then that just becomes a theory of the of truth. Yes. Like the truth. I agree. But, then, but that's, I just want to get my point clear. Yes. Is that if you use a truth yeah. superficially, yeah. you could, is that dealing with the temptation? Not at all. No. Not at all. No, yeah, that, that once, once, once it is, no, it's not, but you are, remember it to you, mm -hmm. you are like to you, you are dealing with it. That's your intention. Yeah, well, yeah, the intention is that, let me go to be true now. Mm -hmm. right. Your intention is to deal with it. But to deal with it superficially. And superficial could mean different things. Exactly. But once you're dealing with it superficially, you're obvious you're not really and genuinely dealing with it. Yeah. Okay, I'm the example because I quoted, <coughs> that king needed endurance. Because they have plenty of love of ease. And it's love of ease that will cause him just to fight about three times and then sit down on his knees and the enemy will come and take him over. Right? So his problem was love of ease. Right? Some people have love of ease and love of ease is what you them and endure. And he needed to hit once, twice, three times, four times, five times, six times, seven times. Then he would have gone. But it was an exposure to him of himself. That's why the prophet gave him that. Okay, so we have five minutes again and then we can go. Let's finish um, one more point. I say on here, so obviously once you're doing this, you're already in transgression, right? So basically this is like it, it kind of set up in um a follower or after effect of the fear of the deception from that particular temptation. So like because he was overthrowing you in the past, you have certain like an overbearing, it, it bearing over you, I have a fear for it that you'll fall. And so when it comes to your mind, you get flustered. You ain't, you ain't start reasoning how to, to adequately use the faith. You get flustered and you start to try and push it out of your mind. I'm pushing it out, I'm pushing it out. That's trusting in the flesh and not using the faith. And we know this, the text that says anything that is not of faith is sin. Right? So I'm going to read two texts and I'll make a closing thing here, right? So Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5 and 7. And Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 9. Okay. Jeremiah 17, 5 and 7. Right. In Jeremiah 17, verse 5 and verse 7, right? And it reads, Thus saith Yahweh, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart depended, sorry, departed from Yahweh. Verse 7. Blessed is the man that trusted in Yahweh, and whose hope, sorry, the Yahweh, whose hope Yahweh is. So it says, well, it's a curse upon the man that trusts in a man or in himself and make it the flesh his arm. Right? The next one is Jeremiah, verse 8 and 9. Verse, Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 9. Yes. Jeremiah 8, verse 9, and it reads, The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of Yahweh, and what wisdom is in them. So once you trust in the flesh, you already reject the word of Yahweh. You have no wisdom. You have no understanding to deal properly with it. You're just in a terrible state. Right? So I just want to make this closing thing, right? So brethren, a time is coming, a day that will test, that will try every man's work of what sort it is. The grace of God must be established in our hearts as a sure and unmovable foundation. The 144,000 will be skilled in applying the word of righteousness to deal with themselves. They will be adept in applying the principles of faith to overcome sin and to maintain a consistent experience of the love of God. 
When they expound truth, it does not consist of theories or abstract theology, meaning theology that thing that you're not applicable to, you're not applying it to yourself. Right? So the, when they expound truth, it does not consist of theories or abstract theology, but their words carry with them a personal, experiential, applicable knowledge of the principal truth of the doctrine to personally overcome sin. They themselves are a testimony of the practical workings of what they teach. Amen. Living epistles of the righteousness of God written in the heart by the Spirit of God Himself. By reason of use, they have proven the light revealed to them. Because if faith has worked in them for righteousness, they are highly qualified to guide others into the same experience. Amen. Amen. That's, that's my study by the grace of God. Wasn't that lovely? Of course, it will be up on the internet for anybody to see. Amen. 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 Brother will pray. And Sister Julia just have something to show us for five minutes. Right? Sister Julia, come up one time with your stuff. Come on, continue on that day. Yeah. Yeah. Continue. I was very blessed. Amen. 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 And Mr. Fison, any study that deals with sin, yeah. of, deal, of how to deal with it and so on, is very fruitful. Amen. Once it's a study to deal with things like that, it is always fruitful. Amen. And the good thing about it is that we have a church that can discuss all these things. Mm -hmm. These are Julia. Right? Okay? It's a wonderful thing. Amen, Bebe? Amen. I can tell you one thing to show all the years I've been in. Lukewarm organization, I've never seen anything like this in yeah. this discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Especially yeah. from somebody yeah. who just came. Yeah. 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 What new me about the university comment? Yes. Yeah. It's a sit here and just a young book, a young, well, a child, a young person giving a study on the on temptation. They have government ministers you know, in our office seeking to deal with crime and organization, <laughs> and they themselves need to be in jail. Young <laughs> <laughs> man. A young man here giving a study how to deal with temptation. I love the pain. Amen. 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 Somebody else. Uh, well, not a touch really here with government. Let's <laughs> <laughs> pray, right? Okay, we are praying. Loving God, everlasting Father, Fathers, the Sabbath close the flow. We thank you, Lord, for this day which we have set aside to show that you are creator and that you are the almighty God. Father, I pray that that which was said today, throughout the day, would stay in our minds, that we will meditate upon it, that we will work in us, O oh Lord God, that we, will, that we would be the final people, Lord, who will spread with this gospel to those a dying world desperately needs you. Loving Father, I pray that as we travel to our various houses, that you will be with us, you will abide in us, and we in you, that you will send forth your holy angels to guide and keep us in all our ways. These mercies I ask, O oh God, in the living name of Christ Jesus, who plans salvation. Amen. Amen.